So all of us are familiar with the idea of the language wars um, in, in computing. The language wars have been around for some time and we've seen them through a lot of different guises. We see them through tooling, syntax, the styles of problems, whether things are relevant in the real world. None of this is new to people attending this, this event. But I would say most of us have experienced this either through the roles of being university level academics or being people working in industry, right? That's kind of been the, the theme here. And it's important to realize that the terrain over which the language wars are being fought has been changing a lot in the last several years. So for a long time, there has been some work on pre-college education. So high school, secondary education. And when that work started, the arguments were about C++, Visual Basic, Java, and yes, some functional programmers on the, on the side. Over the years, that has expanded deeper into pre-college education. So definitely in the United States, and I know in, in other countries around the world, there's much more effort to think about what computing education should look like for students in their elementary and, and secondary. So, you know, ages five to five to 18. And there, at least the perspective I see in the United States, the arguments are around things like Scratch, App Inventor, JavaScript, those are the languages that are dominating this, this conversation. And now it's about to take on a whole new arena, which is data science. Uh, I don't know what the data science wave looks like in, in Europe and Asia or Africa right now, but at least in the United States, there's a real bubble of energy around data science as a job sector issue and a new form of computing education that needs to get broadly woven into, into schools and uh, university curricula. And that's kind of the setting that I wanna be, be talking in today. Now, as soon as you start talking about data science and languages, again, here come the language wars, and everybody's arguing about R and Python and Julia, and which one do we use and why? I don't wanna say stop, take a breath. And let's ask ourselves, what problem are we trying to solve? Anytime the language wars come into play, in my experience, we've spent so much energy arguing for our preferred language that we haven't stepped back to say, what are we trying to accomplish with, with this. So for this talk, I want to set a stage of a problem that we want to work on and then look through the language issue through that problem. So the problem I want to look at is what I'm going to lay out as a challenge for programming education. And I'm thinking more from a K-12 university level perspective than an industry perspective because that's where I, where I come from. We want to be able to provide computing and data science education to all students. And the all is really a big part of the narrative that's playing out around the world, because as you talk about so much of societal infrastructure building on computing and data technology, you have to make sure that the modern workforce is prepared for it. We need to do this in ways that are going to support equity and diversity in computing. This is tied to the all students but explicitly calling out the equity piece forces us to think about how we are gonna handle that aspect of the challenge. And we have to do this working within the constraints of schools, university departments. Like we don't have the magic teaching the quote unquote natural programmers. Uh, now, if you hang out in computing education circles, people will say you don't have natural programmers. You have people who've been taught differently. But still, this is a mindset that pervades how we think about education often. And we have to do this regardless of what a student intends to major in, focus on, have a career in. These are becoming universal skills. We have to teach them that way. When we think about equity and diversity, we need pedagogies that are gonna support students with different preparation and different skills as they come into the classroom. We need problems that are going to resonate across cultures. And I don't just mean world cultures. 
even within an individual country, you have different cultures with different issues they care about, slightly different value systems, and your curriculum are going to need to accommodate that if you're going to get to equity and all students. And we have to acknowledge the impacts of computing on people in society. Um, this is again becoming a much bigger argument in computing education about how do we acknowledge both the strengths and the limitations and the harms of technology, because doing that is part of providing equitable teaching on computing. And on the constraint side, the main constraint I'm gonna focus on here is we don't have enough CS or informatics teachers to go around. We can't put a trained computer science teacher in every school. We don't have the capacity in our university departments to cover everybody. So that has to be part of how we think about this, this story, okay? So what I'm gonna propose as a way to think about how we do this kind of education is to focus on something that I'm gonna call a data-centric approach to computing. And I'm gonna unpack that in a moment so you understand what I mean, but that's kind of the, the tagline for all of this, is a data-centric approach to computing to meet these goals. Now, before I get too far into this, let's just acknowledge that since I'm talking at Lambda Days, I'm going to argue that we do this via functional programming. And we will get to that, to that punchline. But I also want to acknowledge where I'm coming from in terms of my preparation and where I'm situated in this. So I'm a part of two organizations that bring me here. As Francesco said in the introduction, I am a computer science professor at Brown University in the United States. But I'm also the co-director of an outreach program called Bootstrap, which works with middle and high schools in the United States and around the world. So students in roughly ages 11 to 18, okay? With my pre-college hat on, I've been heavily involved in writing standards, educational standards for states for K to 12 computing education. So I've kind of seen how this plays out at the level of school policy in numerous states in the United States. And at Brown, I also wear the hat of being in my department's administration. So I basically am one of the two people who run our undergrad pro undergraduate program, and we are the largest um, major on, on campus. So I kind of see this when I think about constraints and what we need from all of these levels, from K to 12 schools to university departments. So all of that's gonna inform what I'm talking about. I am also, a researcher in computing education. So I grew up as a formal methods and verification researcher. Um, I like to say that I minored in programming languages in graduate school. But in the last 10 years, I've really shifted to trying to understand computing education and to bring all of these topics together. So this is where I'm situated, talking about these, these topics. All right, so let's come back to data centric. Remember I had laid out these criteria around the edges of, of the challenge. So let's unpack this. By data centric, the first thing I mean is we're going to lead our teaching with data, not with control operators, okay? So this is really our first point of departure from the imperative programming style. Like I don't care about teaching while loops and repeat loops and, and things like that. I wanna start with data and let data drive where the curricula go. I want to lead with data that the students recognize and care about, okay? I, hopefully most of us can agree that students aren't that excited about the data that make up the Fibonacci sequence, right? I mean, yeah, some of them are, but that's not going to be how you reach all, all students. We need to meet students where they are if we're going to bring them and the teachers into computing. And to bring teachers from other disciplines into computing to help us with this massive training problem we have, we're going to have to lead with questions that people from other disciplines also care about. And again, you start with factorial and Fibonacci. If I'm a science teacher, you know, doing a biology unit, frankly, I don't really care as, a, as an introductory. Maybe there are connections to some of these things later, but it's not where I start. And the other piece of this that's going to weave through is this isn't just any old functional programming. And I've given a lot of talks on the research I've done over the years about what we've found about how people learn functional programming. And people say, oh, so functional wins. No, 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 no. It's not functional wins. It's very specific choices 
in how we configure curricula and pedagogy that can win. Any of our languages could do this, but it's not functional per se, right? All of this is contextualized in the curriculum and the specific examples that we are using to teach students. To really highlight what I'm thinking about by data-centric computing, I wanna take a specific computing curriculum, functional, of course, and show what it means to turn it around to work with this vision. So I'm taking the How to Design Programs curriculum by Matthias Felison, Robbie Finler, Matthew Flatt, Shriram Krishnamurthy. Um, I'm picking this well because I've been part of that team for a very long time. Um, I am a racketeer at initial training uh, and I have been part of this, this project. And this is an effort that's really focused on teaching program design in a functional context by working students through an essential sequence of steps to develop a program. I don't care about the steps for this talk. What I wanna talk about is the way we organize the curriculum. So what I have here is the list of topics that organize the curriculum in how to design programs. So you start with programs with numbers and strings and images. You go on to structured data, tuples. Then you get to lists of numbers and strings, lists of tuples, trees, mutual recursion, non-structural recursion, and then state comes at the very end. Okay, so I'm taking this just as a starting point. Now, if I'm thinking data centric and I'm looking at this outline, what I'm gonna notice immediately is, ooh, data sets. A list of tuples, that's basically a data set, right? You can take a spreadsheet and encode it as a list of tuples. And to get there, you need to have structures and, and lists, okay? Now, the downside is look at how far that is into the curricular sequence. That's, that's kind of down there a ways. So we really like to know, could we do this content earlier if we're gonna use data to reach out and, and grab people? And yes, I'm gonna argue we can. The fundamental piece of data here is a table, okay? A data set table. And so here I've got a, a snippet that I've taken from a Google spreadsheet, okay? So it's just, a, this is data about ticket sales for an event of some kind. So we have the name of the person who bought the ticket, their contact address, how many tickets they bought, whether they used a discount code and how they're gonna pick them up, okay? Now, if you look at this example, there's a lot of opportunity here. First of all, we have rich structured data in a familiar format. Right? Our students are already familiar, most of them, with the idea of a spreadsheet. They might not know how to process it, they might not know Excel, but the idea of organizing data into rows and columns like this is not something that is phasing, phasing students here, okay? So we already started a ground of familiarity. There are many authentic tasks here that can raise issues that have to do with impact. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those as we, as we go through. But what are some of the authentic tasks? Well, we have data entry errors in the num tickets column. We have malformed email addresses. We have actually typos in delivery methods, which you can't see when this is reproduced. But this is an example from my class where we go through and some we show them techniques where they suddenly discover that somebody wants their tickets by e-mall, not email, okay? So there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this. You get to questions like, how many tickets were sold with a student discount, which lets students explore problem decomposition, but on a concrete format? If you ask somebody, what are all the delivery by email situations, they can imagine chopping up the table to get to the data they want. And then we just say, well, here's the code that does it. We can relate things to physical tasks. And this is something that's well established in the education literature when you're scaffolding learning, that we go from thinking in kind of concrete physical terms to illustrative examples, to slightly more abstract, to much more abstract styles of, of learning. 
This gets into something about planning and designing our programs well. And planning is something that isn't usually taught in a lot of early computing curricula. Oh, we're just teaching them little bits of code. They don't have to plan any of it. Well, yes, they do have to plan it. And you can bring that in because a table is rich and complex enough that students can imagine actually working with it. You can give students a recipe for preparing data for analysis. How do we normalize our data? How do we find suspicious data? How do we use visualizations to sanity check our data? How do we analyze our data? Again, they're rich tasks which students can conceptualize without the computation, without the programs. And then we bring in the programs to tie all the pieces together. And it's worth noting that this is as much data engineering as it is data science. Okay. Um, this is often overlooked when people are talking about computing education, that you need to have data, that data engineering is also a big part of, of what's going on. Okay. And again, this is something we will continue to come back to. So obviously where I'm going with this, given that I'm talking at Lambda Days, is that functional programming is a prime venue in which to do, or prime context in which to do this kind of computing. This shouldn't be news to anybody, but if you're not familiar with the writings of Hadley Wickham, who's one of the lead designers behind R, he's very explicit about it, that R is a functional language. And that it's the fact that R is functional is really leading to a surge of interest in functional techniques. Uh, that we're trying to now figure out how to meet educationally and in also in industrial training. So again, Hadley's book is is great if you if you want to see some of that. Okay, so how does all this map? We started with our baseline curriculum of how to design programs, and fundamentally, what I'm proposing is we're going to swap the orders of some things. So here on the left of my slide, I've given a topic order for a proposed sequence of exercises or topics through which we could teach a data-centric intro to computing. And we're gonna start with things like images, we're gonna elevate tables. So instead of building up from tuples to lists to list of tuples, we're gonna invert it. We're gonna do the to list to tuples up front in the guise of tables. Then we'll come back down to lists, then we'll come back down to data types, and then we'll build out from, from there. And I'm going to walk you through this and actually show you what it all, uh, what it all looks like as we, as we go through um, the sequence of, of problems. Things like planning tasks come in with tables. And socially responsible computing and impacts of computing are also going to come in as we're talking about tables. So let me just give you some highlights of the kinds of exercises that, that you can use in such a course. I have been developing a data-centric intro to computing course at Brown. I've now taught it three times. Uh, and so all of this is drawn from what I have developed and learned in doing that, that curriculum. So I say that we start with images. And what I mean by that is the first thing we teach students how to do is to take, say, a picture of a flag and learn how to break that down into shapes and build it back up as a program. So this is a the snippet of code that corresponds to building this image. So we'll notice that this image is three rectangles stacked one on top of the other. I'll come back a little bit to what language we're actually doing all of this in. Uh, that's, that's not as important right at the moment. But this is the first real program that students write in in my intro class. And the point that I'm driving home here is that there's an alignment between code structure and the result structure that you want. Again, having concrete representations that people can use to align concepts is a core principle from education research. And we're trying to build that in. So with images, they don't even have to think about the complexity of data. They're working with things that are tangible and, and comfortable from the outset. When we go to tables, so here's our same event data table that I had up a little while ago. 
Here's what it looks like in the, the programming language. So we can write a table down syntactically, or we can just import it from a, from a Google Sheet. And then we have functions that look like higher order functions we're used to on lists, but these are higher order functions on tables. In this case, we're gonna compute a new column. Let's say, let's add a column to this table called fee. And the fee is gonna be say $10 per ticket, right? Lambda expressions, the whole nine yards. Yes, I'm teaching lambdas to, to intro students. We're doing it in the context of, of the tables. When we wanna get to lists, we pull down a column and do some analysis on it. So here I'll extract this column of all of the uh, delivery methods. And now we start looking, do we recognize all the methods? Are there typos? These are all the kinds of questions, again, naturally motivated from real tasks. And we do all of this with higher order functions, the same higher order function names that we saw on tables. We have filter on table, we have filters on lists. Okay, we have uh, various building operations, you have maps. So it's really a natural progression for students over to lists. And it's only after they are doing higher order functional programming on lists that we introduce manual recursion. And even then, we're only doing structural recursion over data types where they can see the structure. So we will do structural recursion on lists, but not structural recursion on numbers, because that would require students to be able to see the inductive structure of, num of numbers, which is not a good preliminary topic. Okay, another question that comes up. This is one of my favorite lectures in the course. How do you represent timestamps if we wanted to include timestamps on this data? And I just open this out to the students. I say, give me a proposal for how we're going to put timestamps in here. And some of them put strings, some of them put numbers, some of them have no idea what to do. But this is where tuples can come from, right? That you break down into a tuple of you know, hours and minutes and, and whatnot. And what's so powerful about this is it's really an opportunity to talk about real data design trade-offs and to connect to real world issues. In the real world, practically, many of them will go on to projects where they have to store data in a CSV file. How do you embed a structured tuple in a CSV file? We can have that conversation at the intro level because they've got context. There are some beautiful articles on there out there. One of my favorites is this series, Falsehoods Programmers Believe About. There's one about names. There's one about dates, about the different data schemas you need to represent different cultures, naming and calendaring and time conventions around the world. You can bring this up right here. Equity, social impact in data schemas. It's something, again, that works really well with introductory level students. All of this has been done in the context of tables and a data engineering motivation. But I'm a computer scientist. At the end of the day, I'm teaching an intro computer science class. I have to get to computer science edge topics. How am I going to do that? Well, now we're going to start representing medical ancestry. And I'll give students a data set. I'll say, you know, let's say you have, you're trying to capture uh, ancestry for medical research. So for somebody, we might have their name, when they were born, their eye color, and we need some way to link to the female and male parents because we're going to look at genetic applications. So I can give them a table with which to, to try to do this. And we pretty quickly get to the fact that tables really aren't a great data structure if I have to trace ancestry, right? If I have to get from information about Anna to her genetic parents, well, I have to go searching through the table. We as computer scientists know this as a tree problem. And this is the launching off point for discussing trees. It becomes a really nice illustration for students to say this challenge of working with the tables and thinking about the, the costs and clumsiness of computation suggests different data organizations.
And now we're off into conventional computer science data structures for a while. This is all kind of the functional part of the course, okay? That, and it gets us through a fair bit of material. This is for students from all around campus with no prior computing background. Now, if you look at my outline on the left, I still have state and hash tables, which we have to talk about. Many of us in this community have ways to teach about these in functional programming. I instead take this as an opportunity to shift over to Python. And in my context, the shift to Python is a positive. Because if I'm going to convince students to take this class, I have to convince them that they're going to get a job skill that they can use to get into a project team with a professor or an internship someplace. And you know, Python is more the language of those kinds of opportunities. So the fact that we start functionally and then go to Python at the end to do states and hash tables really ties all this together. The students get a clean, structured way to start the material, and then we move to Python when we're ready for it. We introduce state. I use this as an opportunity to bring up dictionaries. And while we're at it, since we're talking data science, we come back to tables and I teach them pandas. So for those of you who aren't familiar with pandas, it's one of the standard Python libraries for doing data science programming. It's all higher order functions. That's really all it is. It's just dressed up in more syntax and white space errors and all those other beautiful things that you should not inflict on introductory programmers. OK, but the style of coding is just the functional stuff they've seen before. OK, now what I haven't talked about yet is how did we get to this point of of Python linguistically? We haven't haven't talked about um, the functional language that I use to get up to this point. In our case, we're using a functional language called Pirate, which has been developed by the Brown University Programming Languages Group. This is primarily headed by Sriram Krishnamurthy and some of his collaborators, Joe Politz and Ben Lerner, who've been part of the, the Brown group at different points. Um, the pirate name, in case you didn't get it, it's ripped off from Python because pirate adopts a fair bit of the surface looking syntax of Python, not the white space stuff, but a lot of the appearance of code, like function definitions and ifs, look very, very similar to set up this very smooth transition for students from Pirate to Python. I've had them working in Pirate for two months. We then glide into Python with about a day and a half of, of lectures. They have to put, you know, deal with single colons versus double colons. They have to pay attention to the white space based semantics, but it's not a huge shift. And this is all in the design of, of this. I see someone's asked a question. When we go from tables to trees, do students build the trees with recursive programming? Yes, we are still in Pirate when we do trees. So we are doing straight up recursive tree programming. It's only when we need state that I pull them out of functional programming and recursive programming and bring them into Python. Okay, I want to talk just a little bit about Pirate because I'm you know, not assuming that people here know that. So the data structure. So tables are a first class construct in, in Pirate. Uh, and you can read them in from Google Sheets or build them manually as I showed you on the, the slides. You could easily build these into other functional languages if, you, if they don't already have them. Um, this slide mentions Racket because that's kind of where the how to design programs part came from but none of this is, is racket specific. Pirate also has images as a built-in data type. So all the stuff I showed you about um, in that image slide about stacking images, there's a rich library of composing basic image files that we can use to really get students off the ground programming with expressions. Pirate's also really been designed from a software engineering perspective. This is part of the pedagogy of the software engineering, this is also part of how we're going to tie into educational research with going from concrete to abstract. OK. Um, I see there's a question here. Is that shift from Pirate to Python not big for Brown University students or for university students at large? 
So in obviously in my case, I have worked mostly with Brown students, but I have worked with a lot of students who are terrified of taking computer science. And I mean terrified. I, when I started teaching this class, I had students coming in and they would say, I've never stepped foot in the computer science building. This is a scary building. So I'm not convinced that the Brown students who are terrified and convinced they can't do computing are coming in with dispositions that are that far off from a lot of students. We do also have high school students. We have some high school teachers we work with who also have worked on this shift and they're in more mainstream high schools. Um, all right, so there's a question about the relationship between this course and the Bootstrap Data Science course. The Bootstrap Data Science course is the first part really of the university course, with the exception that the university course starts with images and Bootstrap Data Science just starts with the, um, the tables part. But I'll talk about that in a bit when I, when I get back to, to Bootstrap. Okay. And can you use Pirate in real, real world data science projects? It's not going to have all the bells and whistles of, say, pandas, but it has the basics. It has basic plotting, it has the standard statistical operations, you do linear regression. So there's, there's quite a bit of it built in there. Okay. Okay, so I just wanna say a little more about Pirate and the research base of it, because I think this is really important in this community when we all like to argue for strengths and limitations of the styles in which we approach teaching functional programming. We're really doing this um, from a basis of researching how this works in a learning setting. We've done a lot of research, for example, on the integrated examples. We have a tool that's built into the pirate programming environment that will tell, that will help assess students' test suites. So students will write a set of examples and our tool has a bunch of buggy solutions and we'll give the students feedback. Oh, your tests only caught three of our four buggy solutions. There's an interesting situation you're not thinking of. For example, this tool is called Exemplar. It's primarily the dissertation work of Jack Wren, who's one of the PhD students in our group. Uh, and this is, is it something we've spent a lot of time researching and building into, into the language. We've also been looking at tooling to help students explore different data structures. Do you use tuples? Do you use lists? Do you use tables? What columns? One table or two tables. All of these are rich conversations that students need to learn about from a data structures perspective. These are also things that we have done research on and we build the tooling into Pirate and into the, the language. Okay. And again, it's all driven by computing education research. If anybody's interested in the research angle of any of this in computing education, you know, feel free to reach out to us because we're really one of the few research groups. Um, that we're aware of internationally that comes with really deep expertise in programming languages and verification and computing education. We really know how to work at that, at that nexus now. Just to step back a little bit, since there have been some, some questions about the course itself, the course at Brown is called um, CS111. If you were to look on my webpage, you would find a link to the course. So far, we've had 550 Brown students go through it. They love it. The non-majors just love it. Um, these are, as I mentioned earlier, students who said, I never would have imagined taking a computing class. And many of them have decided to take, don't tell anybody, a second class or to add a computer science major because they're finding comfort in how they come into computing through this. Even more importantly, I hear from lots of students who said, I went back and got a job with my public policy professor doing some data analysis for them. And so we have students now working in labs around campus off the skills they got out of this course. And that's what I wanted to achieve with this, an introduction to computing that would actually show them data and CS, but let them do the work they wanted to do in their home disciplines. And I think that's really important. 
If you're interested in the bigger argument of all this, Shroom and I had a CACM article back in July, Data Centricity, a Challenge and Opportunity for Computing Education, which lays out the whole story here. And the textbook for all this is in progress. Uh, it's It will, should be out in March. Um, we're just putting the finishing touches on the, on the artwork for, for all of this. Okay, so briefly to checkpoint, this was the outline that I, I set out for you. And we're not fully there yet. We haven't really talked about other disciplines in depth. We haven't really talked about pedagogies for students with different skills and the resource constraints. Now, I know we're running close to time, so I'm not gonna go into deep detail on this, but I did wanna spend a slide just mentioning the outreach work that we do um, for a program called Bootstrap. And here, I wanna put a shout out to Phil Wadler, who selected Bootstrap as his kind of charity for, for Lambda Days. And throughout, Phil has really been a, a vocal supporter of what goes on in Bootstrap which I think is really nice, especially because Bootstrap started in Racket and Phil's from Haskell. And it shows that you know, these language communities really can see value in what we're doing across, across languages. Um, so I just wanna thank Phil for that. What Bootstrap is, is a curricular project that integrates intro com computing and data science into pre-existing classes pre-college. So we develop modules that put material into algebra classes, science classes, social studies classes. The questions and the projects are driven by the host discipline. The project you do in the algebra class all consists of algebra word problems. They just happen to be used to build a video game. The science curriculum, word problems that do data anal analysis and build science simulations. Social studies, data science questions that explore trends in history and social science. We assess learning in the host discipline. We're not after computer science here. We're after showing teachers that computing augments what they already want to do. And that's really the research mission in Bootstrap. The pedagogic mission is to do this with teachers who are new to computing. We have run thousands of teachers through these workshops math science teachers who've never written a program in their lives and they come out of a couple of days of professional development and they can start using these techniques in classes. They build off of a way of thinking about what we do in functional programming that's very structured. So I've just put an example up here of a worksheet that we would use in the bootstrap program and here we break down the process of writing a program or solving a word problem into three steps that us at this conference would recognize as types, math teacher calls them domain and range, tests, the math teacher calls them concrete examples, and functional code, which the math teacher calls symbolic form. When we take the ideas that we use in functional programming and stage them, aligned with what the disciplinary teachers are already teaching, we get a powerful combination. And functional lets us do this in ways that imperative gets in the way. We don't have extra junk in the program spec. We don't have new operators. We just have to teach people to write things in our notations. And if we keep that load down, My leading argument is that leading from data is how we're going to support computing education for everybody. It enables us to have authentic tasks in many fields. It lets us bring up issues of social impacts of computing, which is going to matter for equity and matters for getting this to everybody. And we can accomplish a lot with small amounts of code, which is what lets this scale to people who are not computing experts. The great news for us at Lambda Days is functional programming can get us there. It's really, really exciting. And when we think about language wars, data science is giving us a new foothold 
to re-enter these discussions about university scale and state and national scale education because we are the style of language that's gonna make sense in this context that people are talking about. But the linguistic and pedagogic details matter hugely. We have to not fight so much with each other about which approach to functional is going to make the most sense. We really have to lead with the linguistics and pedagogic details and think about how to build those into the different languages and platforms that we're all interested in thinking about. Because functional alone will not be the thing that achieves victory here. It's really going to be careful attention to all of this. From a resource perspective, I do want to say something about what I'm seeing going on in the United States at the university level that I'd be curious to hear how it's playing out in other countries. We're seeing a lot of places jumping on the bandwagon of data science by saying, we need a data science major. And it's interdisciplinary, it's from the applied mathematicians, it's the statisticians, and oh yeah, computer science, they can, they can come along if they want to. And a data science major generally starts from an intro stats class, maybe a data scripting class in R, Python, Julia. And then there's more stats and big data, and data management, when you start to get into the data engineering. Now you look at the two conventional computer science major, we start with intro programming, which as all of us know is often imperative. We get to data structures, and then we get to databases, data science, and machine learning. These are very different approaches to getting at, at material here. And what I'm seeing happening at Brown is we get students who say programming is great. I've now seen this. I've decided I really want to be a computer science major, not a data science major. And we get computer science students who get to data science as an upper level course and say, oh, this data stuff, this is really neat. I'd really rather be focusing on data science. And if we're not careful, we have set up two silos here where it's very hard for students to move from one focus to the other. And this is me with my administrative hat on. How do we deal with the headache of somebody saying, I took this intro scripting class in data science, but now I want to do more CS. Well, you've missed all of our intro. You've got to start over again. It doesn't scale. So I think what's really going to be, be helpful here, especially when you get to students saying data science who now need to take upper level CS classes, we really need to think about how to align intro computer science and intro data science so that we buy students time. Buy students time to figure out which questions they care about. And this is part of this positioning of this data-centric introduction that I'm doing, is we show them enough data science and enough computing in a shared first course that they then decide, do I want my second course to be more intensive in data structures or to be more intensive in data analysis? And I think this is a debate that many of us are going to have to have if we are in academic settings about how to structure the accommodation of data science. Okay, so one last slide to, to pull it all, all together. I think computer science and data science and data engineering, they're fundamentally the domains that we're talking about educating people in as we, as we go. Data engineering is frequently overlooked when we have these discussions, but that's really where a lot of computer science and data science come together. And you can't do data engineering without some degree of computer science. Data science appeals to students across campus. They can relate to the questions that data science asks. Intro computer science courses are still largely here, outside of the intersection of these disciplines. But to do data engineering, you're gonna need non-trivial computer science. To do computer science going forward, you're gonna have to have statistics and data science. That's just where the field is going. And the increasing calls for social responsibility force us to talk about what society is doing with data. So I'm arguing that the sweet spot is here in this intersection. And for us at Lambda Days, this is our territory. This is what we excel at. We just have to embrace it. 
I am happy to spend the rest of the time taking any questions and, and thoughts here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was looking for a QA. and a Looks like you know, we have a question from uh, Phil Wadler you haven't answered. So uh, let's see. Yes, how you to want make me to read? Yeah. OK, so how to make tables easy to import in languages other than Pirate. I am not enough of a of an expert in these other programming languages to know what the engineering was. Um, I mean, basically, as I understand it, it's a parser into a table data structure at essence. So, you know, if you have a read CSV operator and you can build a table data type, that's really all we're doing in Pirate, to the best of my knowledge, and then defining a library of higher order operators to go over them. So I don't think that's a hard thing to do at all. It's just engineering that has to be done. Okay. Um, I'm my mouse back over to the, the questions here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They look more like comments. Yeah. So, and I think you know, we have run out of time now, uh, 3.20, I believe. So uh, what I would suggest is why don't we meet in the lounge and yeah. we can continue the discussions there. I know I've got quite a few questions myself I'd like to answer. So uh, very, very interesting. So a big thank you. Can we all kind of, well, I wish we could all unmute, but let's all give uh, Kathy a virtual clap. Thank you so much. Thank you very uh, much. For a re really, 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 really inspiring talk. See you in the lounge. Thank you.